Welcome to Banfield. Hold on to your hat, your wallet, and your heart. Tonight, a tale that's got everything from love, laughter, betrayal, and greed to great fortunes won and lost and exotic destinations. And according to the U.S. government, after this weekend, this story could be all about you. The Federal Trade Commission, the agency in charge of protecting us, protecting the American consumer, has just released an advisory about the biggest fraud across the country right now, and it goes straight to the heart. Romance scams. Yes, I said it, romance fraud. It is now bigger than bank fraud. It is even bigger than healthcare fraud. And if you're saying, I would never fall for a love scam, well, then maybe count yourself among one of the lucky because based on the FTC's warning, it is happening to far more people than you think. In fact, 80% more people in 2021 were swindled by wannabe Romeos than the year before. And then check out this number. It climbs to 600% when compared to 2017. In dollar amounts, it means $547 million were stolen by love scammers just last year. That is over a half billion. And in the past five years, regular people just looking for love have lost $1.3 billion. And it's not just a few people losing a lot of money either the average person lost about $2,400. So that's hundreds of thousands of victims, people being taken for a very expensive ride. But why are they being so easily taken? We all know the con artists are out there. I mean, right now, one of the most popular Netflix movies on, uh, out there is, is a documentary called The Tinder Swindler, a true story about a serial romance scammer. So shouldn't people know better? The problem is the internet and online dating. While it has done wonders for helping people find that special someone, it's also made it much easier for crooks to find that special someone. They can cast a wider net, they can pose as anyone they want, and they can learn everything about you before you even think about swiping right. I want to bring in someone who unfortunately knows all about this and all too well. Rebecca D'Antonio lost $100,000 to an online dating con man. Rebecca, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Tell me what happened to you. Well, uh, firstly, thank you for having me. I, um, I had never tried online dating before, and I had uh, never even known that romance scams were a thing so of course when it happened to me uh, it took a while to sort of figure out that that's what had actually happened a friend of mine had decided that she was going to try online dating and she had never done it before and since i hadn't been in a relationship in a while i thought well this is you know feels like a new thing let me let me give it a shot and uh, so I signed up on a site that I knew to be, or at least thought to be, reputable, which was OkCupid. And I, I knew it to be reputable because I know friends that have met their significant others and are married with children uh, now. So uh, I thought that, OK, well, I'm going to be really smart about this. I, I really don't want a one night stand or, you know, to be a notch in someone's bedpost. So I'm going to basically put in my profile that this is the box that I come in. Uh, this is what I expect in a relationship. This is what I won't put up with in a, rela in a relationship. And um, what I didn't realize at the time, because of course awareness is key, uh, was that I was creating kind of a roadmap around what would have been red flags for me. And so uh, one of the details that I actually put in my profile, because of course in developing uh, feelings for someone and moving forward with a relationship, I didn't want to have un uh, unrealistic expectations of each other uh, was that uh, I love children but I can't biologically have children so uh, essentially what had happened was in order to uh, get to know each other and chat on the platform you have to both like each other and so enter Matthew into the picture uh, who was a single father of a young son his wife uh, had passed away a couple years before from cancer 
Uh, he was originally from Australia, uh, who had been adopted into the United States. So he had a bit of an accent, which of course I loved. And um, we, he was having some trouble with the platform, so we moved off the platform and started uh, talking on the phone, emailing, sending text messages, using Facebook Messenger quite a bit. And uh, we had really hit it off because as I soon, well, not so soon learned actually, this, this scam had taken place over the course of a year uh, that uh, they know what to say to disarm you. They know what to say to make you feel valued. This is their bread and this their bread and butter. So they're very practiced at it. Uh, right, so and you gave them that roadmap, right, Rebecca? So he he knew exactly how to push your buttons and where your vulnerabilities were. So as I understand it, they um, mined some photos from a New England attorney and uh, used those photos to say, this is wh who I am, a nice looking guy. Yep. But the big question I think a lot of people would have is, the, it's totally understandable that you could fall in love. I mean, words are worth, you know, everything. However, you'd never met him. You'd never seen him in person. And then the requests for money started coming. So how did you accommodate for that and think, yeah, this is okay? Well, we had decided that we would meet after his next business trip, which he was actually taking his son on. And he was an oil magistrate, an oil contractor, so a lot of his travel was international. And so while he was on that business trip, they look for that hook. They look for that, what's that thing that is going to make uh, someone send a little bit of money? And for me, unfortunately, it was the, the child. He had presented me with what was, to me, a very plausible uh, you know, scenario, which is that his, the cards that he was using uh, to, for his expenses had stopped working. And I had traveled internationally, and you can notify the bank five times that you're traveling, and something like that still happened. It had happened to me. So to me, that was very plausible. And I had asked all the questions one would ask, like, gee, isn't there someone else that you could appeal to? You know, we're very, you know, relatively new in this relationship. We still haven't met yet in person. Uh, you know, this is a work trip. Can't your, your work help you? And of course, he's an independent contractor, so that complicated mm. matters. They have but an answer for everything, he don't did. they? I he mean, did. He did. He had incredible. an answer for, for all the things. So, and the hook that got me was the fact that his son was with him. Was I going to be mm. the, the horrible person that left a child in a bad situation? Of course. Again, pressing your buttons because he yeah. knew about your desire to have children and, and couldn't have them. So here's the big question. Um, at some point, you realized that you were in the hole for $100,000 and you started to recognize that this was a scam. When you confronted him, as I understand, you've been very public about this, you told him that you were at such a depth in your life because of this that you were contemplating suicide. What was his response? I will never forget, we were speaking on the phone. It was the last time that we spoke. And the level of indifference in, in his voice when he said this to me, I'll never forget it. He said, well, you have to do what you have to do. Mm. It's just, it's unbearable to think that. Did, did anyone ever help you? Did anyone ever trace who it was? Did you find out who it was? And I guess most importantly, did you get your money back? Well, um, it, you know, I had at the time that this was all kind of wrapping up and I was entering the next phase of my nightmare, which ended up being bankruptcy. It was a friend of mine that, you know, sort of held my hand through it all. And with her, I became braver to let a few more of uh, people know what had, had to actually happened because my friends knew that there was this relationship. What they didn't know was this hidden uh, financial dynamic because it is very much an emotional and financial rape. I really needed that hand holding. I really needed that, that shoulder and that hand up to, to have the courage to take the next steps. And so uh, they, I had friends had found me a wonderful support group uh, called Scam Haters United, 
Uh, and with them, they were the ones that actually, uh, because they had been through the same thing, uh, were able to help me to digest and to sort of put it all together, what actually happened to me. And then uh, from there, I went through the bankruptcy process. I never did get my, my money back from the scammers. It's very hard to do that uh, with international law and other obstacles to overcome. I did was it determined that they, it was an international syndicate? so many of them are based out of Nigeria. They're actually criminal gangs that pose as a lover. Yes, yes, it was a criminal gang out of Nigeria and they were using uh, the scam. They have a playbook that they basically use to scam people. And so that's, that's what is believed to have happened, that they were using this scam playbook uh, to swindle me out of my money. The, I did get money back, but it wasn't from the scammers. So um, Western Union and MoneyGram, which are uh, wiring conduits, uh, were mm. found to be at fault um, by the FTC and the DOJ. And there's been uh, class action lawsuits. And I, I am part of both class actions. The, the Western Union one is finished. Uh, and the MoneyGram one is in process. And I have... Well, there's a little. I've seen some... I mean, it's a little, right? Yeah, it's a little. But it's not you know. that... It's not the, the, the heartache. You can never get that back. Rebecca, thank you for sharing this. I know you share this so that other people can be aware that there are real victims that can mm -hmm. fall for this. Um, but I really appreciate you telling your story tonight. Thank you so much. Happy to do it. Thank you for having me. So how can we catch these heartless love crooks? And how can we be really sure those potential romances aren't really a scheming band of common thieves in a land far, far away? Dan Eckhart is an attorney and a former federal agent and prosecutor. Bella Gandhi is a relationship expert and the founder of the Smart Dating Academy. And Tim McGinnis is the founder of the Society of Citizens Against Romance Scams, a worldwide nonprofit that supports and advocates for victims of online dating scams. Welcome to all three of you. Tim, I want to begin with you. I just listened to Rebecca's story and it's just heartbreaking because this, these are real emotions and she called it an emotional and financial rape, and I think that is a very apt description. But is there anyone who falls victim to this more than others? Any demographic? Is it women? Is it men? Or is everybody at risk? Um, there's slightly more men than women, but the definition of what this is, is it's a relationship scam. It's based upon a trust relationship between the scammers. There is no he, by the way. It is a they. Scammers work in teams of professional individuals that do their part over the lifetime of the individual scam. Um, but it is a profoundly traumatic experience. And unfortunately, there are vast numbers of organizations out there, like the one mentioned, that are not legally authorized to support scam victims. Our organization is registered with the Department of Homeland Security, DOJ, and we are, in fact, a Federal Trade Commission Sentinel reporting partner. So our organization is a global organization that supports scam victims worldwide, a little over 7 million victims in the last six years. The problem with the demographic is that it is a, a spectrum running from teenagers all the way to the elderly. The younger tend to be scammed more often, and their resiliency is stronger, so it has less traumatic impact on them. But as you get older, these relationships are deep, profound, lasting, the equivalent of a legitimate husband and spouse relationship. And as a result, when it terminates, it's profoundly traumatic and it can leave victims in severe, literally up to and including full-blown PTSD and whatever support and uh, recovery programs must incorporate a trauma-informed perspective on this. Yeah, these are the average losses, by the way, on the screen right now in your, you know, 18 that's actually to 29 very phase. Low. It's, uh, that's low? Those are low numbers? Yes. The wow, average I think that's for, for the Federal the Trade Commission numbers. So, yeah. The average for an adult is $14,500 for the FBI. See, the problem with all numbers that you reported is they're grossly low. Not your fault, but it is the federal government can only report what's actually reported to them. To and them, since yep. That makes Only 1% of it victims does. report, you have to take these numbers and multiply them by 100 to 200 to come up with realistic numbers. 
to get the real story. Bella, let's talk a little bit about um, the breakdown of the victims, according to the FTC, and again, for, for what that's worth. Uh, men are more likely to engage in risky decisions, apparently, when it comes to online dating. They're less likely to do background checks than women, um, and they're more likely to let a stranger pick them up at their home, as is evidenced by this statistic here. Men, 36% uh, of the time, will say, sure, go ahead, pick me up at home, whereas women will only do that 14% of the time. It's usually a pretty old trope that the con man is preying on the wealthy widow, uh, Bella, but do we, do we make the same mistakes? Do men and women make the same mistakes when it comes to being conned and swindled at this level? Yeah, we've seen both men and both women go through heartbreaking and traumatic things. And to your point, right, evolution, men are wired to protect and provide. And along with that, so many can feel more immortal and invincible. So we at Smart Dating Academy, we're always cautioning our male clients, don't agree. It's very chivalrous and gentlemanly to ask somebody to pick them up at their house. But be wary of doing that. Don't do it. Don't go into neighborhoods where you're unfamiliar we live in this world and you have to you have to behave in a safe manner but both men and women when they're especially we've been through two years of covid isolation and we've been alone and unplugged and when you feel like you're in that dark place and that nobody's going to love you there's no lid to your pot out there suddenly boom when you get it's a match and it seems to be you know somebody that's an oil magnate or or a beautiful woman who's 25 years younger than you, people can get sucked in really easily because it appeals to their deepest desires, which is to find sure. love. We just want to find love. And boy, there's a drug right there. You know, love is a drug and it can make you think and do crazy things as well. Dan, let's talk a little bit about the logistics of it. Uh, you heard Rebecca say that she couldn't get her 100000 back, but she got some things back from some agencies that were a part of this crime. Um, and that is the wiring agencies and banks. But, but realistically, Dan, how hard is it and how much are you going to get back of what you lost if you go through those agencies? Realistically, uh, it's very, very difficult to get anything back uh, because of the nature of the crimes. Most of these crimes are committed by overseas gangs. Uh, some are in Africa. We've got gangs out of China, uh, former Soviet bloc countries. Uh, the clearinghouse for the information is going to be the FBI. It's the um, Internet Crime Complaint Center, which is a website which is really probably the first place you should go is go to the FBI's website. You make a report and they will try to, you know, again, combine this information with other victims. The other place to go to is your bank. Uh, interesting enough, banks have informal channels where they can go bank to bank and try to recapture some of these funds if it's done quickly. But um, at the end of the day, you're probably out of luck. It's almost impossible to get that money back because it's someplace it's been transferred to Nigeria, then back to China, then, then you know, who knows where. Okay, I just want to read off a list of uh, some of the, the, the four common uh, best tips for anyone out there uh, to be able to see the red flags. And this comes courtesy of the, of the FTC as well. Nobody legitimate is ever going to ask you to send them cryptocurrency or give gift card numbers or wire them money. Anybody who does it, uh, big red flag, likely a scam. Number two, never send money to a stranger if you have not met this person. Do not send money. Um, don't think a photo is the same as meeting someone in person. And even after meeting them in person, there's a lot of you know caution you have to actually employ. Don't take investment advice or counsel or invest in things they recommend either. Talk to friends and family. If you've got a new love, pay attention. They might be concerned, and it's good to hear what they have to say. Just bounce it off someone else. Don't be alone in your thoughts. And then this one might be the best one. Do a reverse image search. Oh boy, can you catch people in a lie when you do that? Because <laughs> these people have to steal the photos from somewhere. And right. chances are they had to steal the photos from the internet. And chances are you can do the reverse photo search and find those photos somewhere else belonging to a legitimate uh, person. Dan Eckert, Bella Gandhi, and Tim McGinnis, I can't thank you enough uh, for your guidance. Thanks so much. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.